I trust you have already worshipped and you are in the midst of it. And we will continue to do so through uh, the word. Thank you, Caleb, for uh, reading our text for us this morning. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, I looked at all these up here. You know how good they are when he said, you know, what's the comfort of this? Some of them just went straight to, to 2 Corinthians 1, 6 and said, if I'm afflicted, Paul says, I am so for your comfort. Others went straight to, to Psalm 23 and, and just, you know, wanted to read out and say, you know, your rod and your staff is a comfort, right? You all were thinking all these verses that this came up, yes? <laughs> just like, like they were doing. They, they're so good. But anyway... Uh, we're, we're looking at, at Matthew chapter 14, and it is one of these chapters that is riveting in so many ways. I think most people, if they don't have a clear sense of, 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 uh, of the Bible even, they, they'll know this story. If nothing else, they know some of the kind of the base idea of it, right? So walking on water, we use that sometimes now even as an idiom. Right? So, you know, someone is asking you to do something really difficult and you know your way out and say, well, I can't walk on water. Um, or if you want to brag on someone and you say, man, this dude can do everything. This, man, I'm just telling you, he can walk on water. We know that expression, yes? You're here. Yeah, I just want to make sure. Uh, because what we see here is this is one of these miracles that people struggle with. You know, not only is it one we take it and we turn it into just some kind of idiomatic phrase about doing all kinds of things, even the impossible, or many people just try to explain it away. And so, you know, even when you look at scholars, some of these, these incredible, and some of them are actually funny. I'm going to mention one of them. Uh, they, they say, well, he didn't actually walk on water. There was just a reef right below the surface that he walked on, right? And, and Peter, who had been fishing there all these years, didn't know about it. So when he stepped out of the boat, he just missed the reef, and Jesus picked him up on the reef. And others say, no, 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 that was not it, because they would have known of that. No, there used to be a long pier going out in the water. And that has all you know, come to pieces since then. But, you know, the, the, the pillars or the poles that, that got into the ground were still there, so they were just kind of... Jesus was just kind of finding them as he was walking, right? The most ingenious, I think, suggestion trying to explain away this miracle uh, was uh, by one who said, well, you know, we all know that, that it was dark and Jesus was coming and, and uh, there was no boats around, so he just found a board. And he just stood at that and let kind of the waves and the stream take him out. I guess Jesus was just the first surfer in the world, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Uh, when you do that. But, you know, when you, when you look at it, there's something going on here that is really, really significant. If you, if you begin to look at the text itself, there's so much strength, right? We, we are at this point, we're talking about praying through storms, and I don't know very many people who can say with a straight faith, I don't go through any kind of storm, so I had never done so. Storms are a part of life, but how do we pray through it? How do we see and understand the purpose of some of these storms in our lives? And, and so let's just read the text. That very first verse, he, that's Jesus, made them go into the boat. Well, that's a strange thing to say. Well, the word there is actually kind of kind when it says made them. Uh, the word is a pretty strong word. The word compelled would probably have been a better translation. And, you know, in some other context where, where that is, is probably what it was meant, it is translated forced them. And, you know, that's a kind of a, uh, the idea here is that he compelled them to go in the boat. They, you you get, out, get in the boat, get out there, and sail to the other side. And he said it with such kind of directness that they felt like, well, we better do that. This is not an opportunity to say, no, we're going to stay here on land with you. He said, get in the boat, sail to the other side, and I'll come on later on. And then, of course, as he sent them away, he was then going up to the mountains to pray. And so think about this just for a moment. I, I want you to kind of hold on to that. When it says that 
after they gotten out a little bit out into the lake, is what it says in, in, uh, in our translation here in, in, in the Gospel of John, it's a little bit more clarified. He says when they'd gotten about 25 to 30 stadia out, that's about three or four miles out into the waves, they were in trouble. The waves were buffeting the boat and throwing them around. And, and so what's going on with this? This was the second time they were in trouble on the waves on the sea right there. The first time, however, oh, in, in chapter 8 of Ma Matthew's gospel, Jesus was in the boat, and they were fearful. They said, what are we going to do? So they woke him up, and he stilled the storm. It was as if this, this was the first lesson to teach him, trust me, trust me. You need to learn to trust me in these storms. But then they felt this here was different, right? They, they, and, and you wonder what's going on in their mind, but then again you realize we're just the same. If you read that, that whole chapter 14 of Matthew, you'll see Jesus had just fed probably about 20,000 people, 5,000 men, it says, plus the women and all the children, with just two fish and five loaves. Massive kind of miracle. Just unbelievable. And then they got down, he sent them away, and he went up to pray. And yet, they felt this is different. And so, so what happened? Well, they got into this trouble. And why were they in this, this difficult, stormy situation? Well, because they had exactly done what Jesus told them to do. They have been obedient to his word. Can I, can I say as a parenthesis here that, that, uh, that you're obedient to Jesus' word, that you follow what he says, does not make you immune to difficulties. It does not shelter you from troubles in your life. In fact, when you look at, at and then read some of the biographies of these greatest men and women throughout history that had just followed God and they get thrown into one big difficulty after the other. And you see, that is just the case all the time. In fact, when you read the book of Acts, you realize that, that the very reason that, that these people got into all these troubles was exactly because they had heard Jesus says, go and be my witnesses. And that put them in that situation. You know, if, if there's no struggles in your life, how would you learn to trust? Ever thought of that? It was as if these, these disciples and the early Christians, as they were learning, you know, how do I pray through this? How do I learn to live the Christian life in face of all the things that come at us when we are faithful to Jesus? They're learning to trust. One moment of learning after the other and, you know, it's, you know, we might say it in, in, in a different kind of imagery. We say, you know, uh, the places where there's no rain and this sun is shining all the time, it's a desert. There's something that is going on here that we need to, to think about. Just think about the Acts of the Apostle. If you, you haven't read it and you don't really know what I'm talking about, you will find it after the service and just put a note in there, I need to read this book. Called the Acts of the Apostle, follows the Gospel of John, and it delineates kind of the early kind of struggles of the church and, and how the Gospel spread. And what you see is, is that early on, you see one called Stephen, who because he would, would uh, just cling to his gospel presentation and would not give in, he was stoned, and right as he was stoned and as he was breathing his last breath, heaven opened and the resurrected Lord was standing at the right hand of the Father and giving him peace. So you see Paul. You see Paul who again, because he would not bend and let go of that gospel presentation, they stoned him, they thought he was dead, they laid him there, and what happens, the greatest example of what the church is all about happened, the disciples gathered around him and he got back up to serve, yes? 
That's the church imagery, if you ever will see that. Or you see uh, further on as you go, think of all the Christians in Rome who literally were, were smeared in oil and, and used as lamp in the streets of ancient Rome, and yet it was their consistent and ongoing testimony that suddenly took over Rome, and Rome now became this power center from which all the Christian faith was scattered around the globe. Learning to trust. I got to ask you, I have to ask myself, if my life had changed that much. Just look at it. I'm going to step a little bit closer to this text again. We're going to stay straight with the text. And now we get this image of Jesus is up there on the mountain while the disciples are fighting the waves of the sea. Jesus up there interceding for them while they're struggling down here with the waves and the storm. You know, if you read the same story again about Jesus walking in the water over in the Gospel of Mark, you will see him highlighting that Jesus was up there and he could overlook the whole lake and he saw the disciples, the Bible says, struggling with the waves. He was hidden from their eyes, but they were not hidden from his. Are you getting this? They could not see him, but he saw them. And, and later on, when we, we read about these disciples, how they stood as, as rock in the midst of persecution from the Roman military power, or as rock in the midst of persecution from the Jewish leadership, you ask, how do they find that strength? Well, maybe it's because they've come to this clear conviction that although they couldn't see him who was up there interceding for them, they knew he saw them as they were struggling here. Powerful, powerful uh, image that we have right here. You know, I know good and well that some of you are, are thinking, you know, I, I don't, if I don't see it, I can't get there. You know, there's a word for that. Oh, baloney. Um, the word for that is really that. Think of this. Most of us, oh, I forgot my phone. Most of us have a phone, right? And if you click in one of these map programs, it'll tell you where you are. You don't see where that's coming. If you drive down the street, it'll follow you right there. If you have a Find My Friend app, you'll know where they are. Are you hearing me? I, I was flying from, from Germany to back to Texas at one time, and, and my, my luggage got lost. And a couple of days after, I got a note that said, they had no idea where it is. You know, I can't find it, and, and I shouldn't anticipate getting it back. And I wrote them back and said, I know exactly where it is. It's in that particular airport, and it's in that particular room, because I put a little kind of a button in it. And they went, oh. <laughs> you know, we, we, we have satellites orbiting the Earth that, that can photograph every place, and they photograph other kind of military moments that we have a sense of security because we know that. And some of these cameras are so clear, they can read the text on vehicles, even on smaller boxes, very clearly. Why is it that we know that and find it difficult to really realize that he who is up there interceding for us at the right hand of the Father, not only does he see us, but he will call us by name as he intercedes for us to the Father. This is powerful stuff, friends. I, I hope you see what, what is in this text right here with this, right? And, and we can go on. You know, it's like the old Lena Sandel was, was singing, and we, many of us know this song, right? Day by day. You know that song? Day by day, by every pressing moment, I trust in his power. I trust in his power. 
Look at this text. I'm pressing on a little bit because there's so much here, right? And, and, and just notice another little thing that we may skip over uh, about divine delays. What does this say here? They say, well, he came to them in, in our text here. It, it just is translated just kind of to make it smooth. Uh, he came very early in the morning. The text actually says he came in the fourth watch of the night with at 3 a.m., and you'll wonder why, why didn't he just come when he saw them at first time? Just come on down and, and rescue them. And, and the point is, is this, that he had to let them feel the full weight of these waves, the full strength of the storm. And only when they saw the, the, the fruitlessness of trying to save themselves were they ready to have him come to help them. You know, if you're like me, you're thinking, why does God not help me now? I mean, he should come now. We're not good with quote-unquote divine delays. Why, why is that? And I've said it before, right? God's mighty clock doesn't always go tick-tock, tick-tock, the same way our little watches are doing it. So here's a fantastic story. Some of you are old enough to know uh, a Chinese missionary, a Chinese Christian called Watchman Nee, right? And, and, you know, when I came up in my kind of teenage years, you want to read like a Christian book or a spiritual book, do you read one of his books, some, some, so to speak? And he gives this story, I still remember that, where, where there was this Chinese family living kind of on the riverbed, and, and everything kind of happens right there in the river. That's where they wash. That's where they wash their clothes. They wash, they wash their dishes. Everything kind of happened right there. It's where they got the water to water their crop and all of that. And then one of the brothers were not that good of a swimmer. And so then the swimming brother was sitting at the, at the, right there at the bank of the water, and the, the, the brother couldn't swim, but kind of, you know, taken up by some of the streams in the water and some of the you know, a white water rush that was right there, and, and uh, he just sat there. And the brother was, was about to drown and going down, coming back up, going down, coming back up. And, and what's my knee tells the story? He said, I stood there. I was so filled with anger toward that swimming brother that didn't run out there to catch him. And then all of a sudden, when it looked like he was going down for the last time, the brother jumped in the water, dived down, picked him up, and he drove took him to dry land. And what Mani tells how he confronted him that evening, said, why in the world did you let him almost drown like that? And the answer came back, that didn't you see? All this time, he was trying to save himself. He was panicky, and he was just trying to do everything he could to save himself. If I come at that point, he would probably pull us both down. I had to wait till he was ready to get the help that I could provide. That's a powerful story, friends. Some of us will not give up, right? We, we keep struggling and keep trying to save ourselves. But it is when we give up trying to save ourselves that God will come down and take us up to where he is. There's just almost too much for one sermon in, in a text like this. So, so how do we pray for this kind of strength? How do we yield to God and say, God, what do I learn when I am in this moment? What is it that I should have uh, from this that I will be stronger the next time maybe a bigger storm and greater difficulty comes? Well, let's look and continue to see here. You know, uh, the difficulty became the very path that Jesus used to step into their lives in a new way. There are two, two uh, miracles, so to speak, in, in the Gospel of Matthews that involves Jesus' own person. And what that is, the first one, of course, is the transfiguration in the mountains, and, and 
The other one is here when he walks in the water. In both these cases, his divinity shines through his humanity. And what happens here is exactly this, that they saw him come, and he is suddenly he reveals himself as the glorious one, as, as God himself in a new and strong way. The very difficulty became the path that he used to walk into their lives with power. I'm not sure of what you all are going through at the moment. I know you are. Some it is in the home, maybe. Some it is at work. Some of you it is in school. Some of you it's among friends. Some of you it may be just internal turmoil in your own soul. But whatever it is, know this, that that very struggle, that storm, that difficulty can become the very path where Jesus reveals his divine power to you, where his divinity, so to speak, shine through even his humanity. The point is that they need to recognize him when he came, and they didn't. You know, you should have thought, they just saw him do this miracle with the 5,000. And then now they're in trouble, and instead of looking for Jesus, they were just going straight back to their old fears, that old crazy superstition. That's the ghost. And then I thought, you know, we do that a lot. When we get really fearful, instead of going to Jesus, we go back to old fears, superstitious nonsense sometimes. I said, that must be because of that. But friends, it is exactly, and our points of defeat, our points of struggle, our points of depression, our points of humilia humiliation, our points of, of missteps, that Jesus comes to us and he says, look at verse 27, it is I, have courage. It is I, don't fear. Learning to pray through the storms in your life. You know, the founder of the modern missionary moment, uh, movement, as we call it, uh, was the, the Baptist and the shoemaker, the British uh, William Carey. He came from a small little village in England, and then he was compelled by God to go to India and his big dream was when he got there that, that he will be able to kind of translate the Holy Scriptures to all these many languages and dialects that he uh, knew were present there. And he got there, and he worked for years upon years upon years upon years, and it looked almost like he was getting to see it happen. You know, he... He, he got out there in the late 1700s, and then in the early 1800s when, when he began to see some fruit from his work, they built a massive, huge printing house. And he gathered a lot of people from, from India to help him translate all this into 12 different languages, as we know. And they were doing that, and they collected paper upon paper, stacks and tons of paper to print all this. They had thousands of new fonts carved and, and made that they would be able to kind of print this new language on Scripture. And one, this terrible morning, one morning, it was the 11th of March, 1812. The whole thing burned down. Is one of the most heart-crunching stories of missionary history. And an observer is talking and writing down what he sees when on the 12th of March, 1812, that William Carey comes and sees all this. And he describes how he stood in the midst of the embers and tears running down his cheek, saying, years upon years 
upon years of work gone in one night. And then the observer writes, he suddenly looked up, and he said, he has made me low that I may look more directly to him. Do you hear that? He has made me low that I may look more directly to him. It was if he had recognizing that Jesus would come to him on these embers of difficulty, that this became the path. Like the disciples, he was compelled by Jesus to go out there, trusting that the one who says, go there to the other side, that he would be with them also in the boat, so to speak. I wonder. I asked myself that, and I'm going to ask you about it. Since I asked myself, I can have a permission to ask you about it, too. Could it be that sometimes we don't see these great miracles in our lives because we flat stayed on land instead of getting in the boat? Instead of getting out there where we had to trust and learn to trust, we just stayed on land. You see what happened here. What looked like a catastrophe for, a catastrophe for the uh, first mission in modern history became the very path of storm and difficulty that Jesus used to walk into that situation in a very new way. When that message came back to England, the, the little stories about Carrie's mission work went from being just a few words on the back page of the newspapers to become long articles on the front pages of the newspapers in London and in England. And, you know, everybody got together. They were all moved by this story, and Anglicans and Baptists and Methodists and London's Missionary Society, everybody began to want to be part of this, and they sent in money, and they sent in money, and you can read about it all you want. They sent in so much money, they had to stop the collection. Imagine that. That's when you know it's not in America, right? They, sorry. <laughs> they had to stop the collection. Imagine that. And it was so powerful, even in India, people who had never even heard his name, didn't know anything about him, they began to hear about it, and they wanted to know more, and they opened their hearts to the message of this man. Large people came to Christ there. And it was so much that, that when, when he was interviewed at, at the end of his life, William Carey said this, and I'm quoting here, the greatest thing that ever happened to the mission in India happened on the night that the printing house burned down. God came to him in the midst of the storm, walking on these troubled waters, if you will. And he came personally. He came personally. It is I. He said, fear not. Be courageous what he says to you. Please hear this, friends. And notice what happens right here. Peter, of course, get spontaneous. Okay, I'm just going to get out of the boat. And what happens? Right as he's missed steps, so to speak, Jesus lifts him back up. And what happens after that? Well, look at it. Verse 33, spontaneous worship breaks out. And where was that? Well, verse 35, in all the surrounding areas, people heard. Day by day, and with, its pa with each passing moment, strength I find for the trials of each day. I'm going to ask us to stand, friends. And I'm going to ask you to listen to your heart. Some of you will need to come pray. Some of you know, will need to grab the hand of someone else.
we have been Christian, many of us, for years and lived through storms as if Jesus was not really, really there. 